I want to talk about his story in my life over the last 13 months. Um, we prayed for Brother Mark and um, about, what's today's date? The 9th. About 13, month ago, 13 months ago, on December 8th, I was in the hospital. I went to a, it was a little Baptist clinic over there on the west side, over off of 90 and couples, and was admitted into the hospital. And I was there for three days, and um, my oxygen really dropped. And um, they, they transported me. They wanted to take me out of town because there was no beds available in San Antonio. But I told them to um, just release me. I'll go to the VA because I'm a veteran. I'll go to the VA, and I, I'm not going to go out of town. And um, a bed opened up at the Bamsey. And they said, we got a bed for you here in San Antonio. We're going to take you to Bamsey. And I went into Bamsey needing um, 60 liters of oxygen. Needed 60 liters of oxygen. They wanted to intubate me, and I, I fought it. They pled with my wife. And um, I want to take you through a journey that, that I lived through through that. And I hope you're blessed by it, and I hope it, I hope it comes out well. Is that good? And I got to watch that. My, my biggest critic, she says, you know, don't say that's good. Don't say that's cool. Um, and while, while I'm doing that, when I do my Bible study, she, she comes in, you know, you shouldn't have did that. Uh, and I did the first thing already. That ain't right. So you might hear some, that ain't right. You might hear, that's cool. Um, you might hear some, come ons. Um, you might hear me cry. I get a little sentimental, um, especially talking about what happened the last 13 months. It, it's really emotional for me um, when you get touched by Jesus and, and you start moving, um, it gets emotional. And um, so we'll, we'll try and make it through there with that. Is that cool? Did it again. <laughs> um, so what I wanted to talk to you about is, um, can we put the next slide up? This is what we do in my Bible study. I, I, um, I have been asked by, I, I coach football, and I'm on a great um, team of coaches. All of them have played at, at, the, at the higher level at college. Two of them have been in the NFL. One retired from the NFL. Great people. And I get up and talk in front of the parent meeting. I said, I haven't been to, I didn't play for college. I played two years in high school. Um, I don't know why he wants me here. But he asked me to start a program in, in um, our, our school called the FCA, Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And, and this man who's retired from the NFL, one of the you know, he, he played, he's, he can move a rack of weights, you know, like they're an empty box, you know, and he says, you tell me when you want to give the word and I will stop everything. We will stop everything to do the word. Awesome man of God. Um, so I developed this, you know, and we want to win. We're at, I'm at Sam Houston High School, um, and, and it's a tough school. They're very talented but their work ethic is really, talent only gets you so far. And we're seeing that, you know, where everybody's becoming talented. And, and our, we, need to, we need to grow past our talents. And um, I developed this. So to win, right, we need a word. We need to be intentional with that word. And then we need to set up some non-negotiables to have a winning mindset. Some call it a heart set. Right? Not just a, a right mindset, but a heart set. Where's your heart at? Right? So for my objective today is we're going to talk about, is the Bible a living document to you? It was for me. It got me through um, those 14 days that I was in ICU. I call them my 12 days of Christmas because I was there for 14 days in ICU, but I got out on, on um, Christmas Eve. Um, of 2020. And I'm going to look at Psalms 1 and 1 Peter. <clears throat> and then um, I want to ask you a question. When, you're, when you get done here, what are you reading and what are you believing? Pastor talked about the news. You know, we can watch the news. The news can get you scared. As me as a teacher, teachers walking out of schools and the Amrakami variant and everything, and you're like, man, I'm, I'm stuck with 28 students, eight periods, 
different students that I could get this virus again. And um, what am I believing, right? I got to believe. And then set up a non-negotiable, right? For me, my non-negotiable is prayer. You got to have some non-negotiables in your life. We do them every day. We have some disciplines in our lives. And a lot of people hate talking about, do you, don't judge me. You're setting a discipline up for me. Um, but you got to have some non-negotiables. I, I, I've talked to young men, and I talked to a young man training for a, a weightlifting thing. And, you know, I go to the gym three hours before school, three hours before, after school. I eat a strict diet. And I'm like, man, that is some discipline. He has set up some non-negotiables. He's not going to miss the gym. He does it more than what he works. And, um, man, what if we did that for the Lord? What would we be at if we did that? Come on. All right, let's go. So Psalms 1, can we get up Psalms 1 there? I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. Some of y'all, I like it. I just like the way it it, it speaks to me. And and, um, so here we go. Oh, the joy of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked and stand around with the sinners or join with the mockers, but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They're like trees planted along the river banks, bearing much fruit each season. Their lives neither wither, and they prosper in all they do. But not the wicked. They're like worthless shaft, scattered by wind. They will be condemned at the time of judgment. Sinners will have no place among the godly. For the Lord watches over the path of the godly. But the path of the wicked leads to destruction. Pretty interesting scripture, right? Um, Psalm 1, in Psalm 1, the righteous and the way of the wicked are described in a stark contrast. The psalmist identifies the way picture evil with progression of walking, standing, and sitting. Some scholars believe this picture is an increasing intimacy with those who do, who do wrong. As the association progresses, so does the level of iniquity, wickedness, sinners, and mockers. The mockers not only engage in wrongdoing, but they also scorn the innocent. Like, Tim, that's, that's a tough scripture right there. Didn't Jesus hang around with some of the bad guys, the tax collectors? But I think he didn't follow their ways. He got them to follow his ways. Right? What are you doing? Um, me and my wife were talking with pastors the other day, and I have a good friend that today we're still friends, and our son played Pop Warner together. And the Pop Warner League that we're in, they had a, a pep rally before the season started. And the pep rally wasn't more for the, the kiddos. I think it was more for the parents. They would party and drink and barbecue, and all the teams would get together. And um, I didn't do any of that. So I volunteered to barbecue for our team, and then I started walking around. And uh, there was a guy at the bleachers singing a, a praise song. He was just singing a praise song, um, sitting on the bleachers. And I said, hey, bro, what are you singing? And he told me what he was singing. I was like, hey, and we just started talking. He was a believer, and I think his cousin was a drummer. Um, and we've been friends for, I don't know, my son's 21. He's playing Pop Warner at... How old was he playing Robert? By about 10. So by 11 years, we've been friends. And um, that, that intimacy started from me just walking around, meditating on the word. And this gentleman was meditating on the word, singing a praise song um, on the bleachers. So check your intimacy, right? In contrast to the righteous delight. Can you get the next slide, bro? What's the next slide look like? All right, stay there. In contrast to the righteous delight in the law of God, all are called blessed. They are consumed by the love for the wisdom of God. It occupies their thoughts throughout the day, bringing to mind the the command of Joseph to meditate on it day and night in Joshua 1.8. In the metaphoric language, the psalmist then describes what it means to be blessed. Blessed are like a tree that grows strong and produces good, healthy fruit, Whatever they do prospers, right? So you might get a technical difficulty in your life when you start reading that word, when you start meditating on it day and night. You might come to a crossroads. And for me, that was COVID, right? I was, that first three days when I was at that Baptist, 
I asked one of the nurses, how long will I be here? How long do you think I'll be here? Oh, five days, we'll be out. It'll be all right. So that's where my mind was. Five days, I'll be good. I'll be home. Just starting. I went in right before um, our last week of school. Um, and I said, I'll be on our Christmas break. But God had other plans, right? And I think he wanted to talk to me. He wanted to, he wanted to, he wanted to show me some things. And, and I wasn't being receptive. I had a little bit of a technical difficulty. The sound stopped for a little bit. Right? And, and for me, when I went into ICU um, for those 14 days, um, um, I was praying. But God was silent. And I said a prayer that I, 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 I did a word study on my, I just prayed. I said, God, I'm ready to go. If it's your will, take me. But I know there's somebody praying for me. And I know they're, they're, they're worth, it's all on you. If you take me, their prayers might be hindered a little bit because they might be confused. And I said, Lord, whatever your will be, let it be done. But if you get me out of here, I promise you that I won't be the same. Right? And in that time period, right, when I, right when I got out of um, the ICU, well, I, I went to ICU for a couple of days, and they moved me to another, I guess it's still, I, they told, the nurse told me it was ICU, but it was a lesser, I was in my own room, I wasn't in that little glass door anymore where you're all open and they can just run in and get you. I was actually in a room, but they said it was still ICU. We lost a coach. At my school, five teachers died. Four teachers died. Five had COVID. I was a lone survivor. And um, one of them was a real good coach. We worked together. We worked the same. We were the D-line coach. We did film together. We did everything together. And I, I spent probably more time with him than I did with my family because um, when you're in football season, I don't know if we have any coaches out there, but when you're in football season, sometimes it's, it's some late nights. Long days, Saturdays. Um, I'm glad I had a coach. Coaches before weren't, but this coach is a God-fearing man. And Sunday he said, we're not doing anything, but we'll work Saturday. And um, he died. He died. We went in the hospital at the same time. He had a heart attack. Um, he was put on a ventilator, and he died. Um, real good man. What I, what, I, what I liked about Coach Phil is he was a believer, so we were... A lot of times we weren't really doing what we're supposed to be doing. We're talking about God. We're supposed to be looking over the other team's defense, and we're talking about God. And, and um, that's how come we probably stayed a little longer. My wife's in there. But, um, he was a good guy. He was a, he was a joker. Um, but he went to be with the Lord. And um, what happened for me in that time period, I was a little saddened. But that same day, I don't know if you... Remember, on Thanksgiving, I, I said thank you to a brother who called me, right? And uh, no, the pastor was praying for me. I knew TC was praying for pastor. I knew they were praying, but I didn't know he was praying. And God told me, I answered your prayer because he was praying for you. He told me he went up on some mountains and he, was, he didn't want me to die. And he went to some great lengths. He goes, I prayed for you day and night. And one thing that was funny about him is he was crying. I'm listening. He's like, hey, bro, I, I love you, but it's not. He, I guess he was so worried about me thinking weird about him. He's like, this ain't weird. I just, I love you like a brother. I'm not gay. I love you. And, and I was like, it's all right, bro. But he changed my life. He changed my life because it wasn't what he did or what he said. It's what me and God were intimate with. And God said, that's why. And I said, because of him, I'm a changed man. I'm a, everybody that I, I run in contact to, you, you're going to hear a little bit about the Lord. And, and um, it's just awesome. And, and we got we to gotta catch that. Right? I know, you know you're hearing something, but you got to catch. A lot of times we catch more than what we we're taught. And you got to catch a lot of times when we see people getting blessed, 
Look at why they're getting blessed. When you see people going through things, look at why they're going through things. Right? It's not always the technical difficulties. It's not always good. Right? But I've, I've seen people go through things that are smiling. I'm like, why are you smiling? Your, your daughter just died. Your son just died. Your, why are you smiling? And we're going to talk about that, right? A devotion that I did on, on um, Psalms 1, um, it said, In memorizing his grandfather's work, Peter Croft wrote, In my deepest desire for a person who picks up their Bible, whatever version they use, to not only understand but experience the scriptures as a living document. Just as relevant, dangerous, exciting now as they were thousands of years ago. A lot of people say the scriptures are dangerous. I've heard there's a book called Dangerous Prayers, right? And I think God says they're not dangerous, they're exciting. When you start praying dangerously, I get excited. I think that's what, God's, that's what God told me. I get excited. When you start talking about things that, that are on the scripture and you're like, and people are like, whoa, whoa, stand back. Lightning's going to strike. He's like, I'm excited. I want to see what's going to happen. You ready to see what's going to happen? And that, that, that's, what he, that's what I think he tells us, right? Peter's grandfather was J.B. Phillips, a youth minister who undertook a new paraphrase of the Bible in English during World War II in order to make it come alive to students at his church. That, that translation is what we call the English Standard Version, right? The English Standard Version was written to come to life for people in World War II. Pretty interesting, right? Like Philip's students, we face barriers in reading and experience scripture, not necessarily because of our Bible translation. We may lack time, we may lack discipline, are sometimes the right tools for understanding. But Psalm 1 tells us that blessed is the one who delights in the law of the Lord. Meditating on scripture daily allows you to prosper in seasons no matter hardship or whatever you're facing. Come on, right? Are, are you meditating on that word day and night? How do you view the Bible? Is it still relevant with insight in, in living today? What I like I like to view things on time. I like to view things on time. If it can stand the test of time, you know it's a good, it's something good. And the Bible has withstood time. On the bestsellers list for years, withstood the time, right? Um, where did I stop off at? It is like a streaming of water, right? Um, what provides the substance we need daily. Today we lean on making time, get the right tools, ask God to help you experience the scriptures as a living document, right? As you, as you get into these technical difficulties, when I, when I talked to Mark, um, I was able to talk to Mark on the phone, and I told him, bro, just breathe. That's what they told me. That's what the, the nurse at the Bamsey, you know, um, I've been out of the military for a long time, but he came up to me. He reminded me of Brother James. I don't know if, if you remember Brother James. His son was death. He's, at a, he's preaching at a death church now, but he's a great man. And um, God, God aligns people in your path when you're going through things. You just got to be keen to that. And this brother... He said, Sergeant Gonzalez, just breathe. And I'm like, what? How does he know my rank? Right? But I'm in the system. I didn't think about it. He says, just breathe. That's all you got to do is just breathe. And you'll be all right. And um, sometimes we got to do that. We just got to breathe. Take some deep breaths. Right? So I want to talk to you. One more scripture real quick. It's First Peter 1, 3 through 9. Can we bring that up real quick? All right. All praises to God, the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again. Because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, now we live with great expectations. And we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reaches of challenge and decay. 
And through your faith, God is protecting you by his own power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. To be truly glad, there is a wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire test purifies gold. Through your faith, there is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus is revealed to the whole world. You love him even though you were never seen him. Though you did not see him, now you trust him and you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. The reward of trusting him will be your salvation of your soul. Real quick. Me and TC were talking. How many of us are anticipating the day of Jesus' return? How many of us are living that way today? Woo. That's a tough one, right? Not, not that today will be your last. I've heard that today will be your last day. What are you doing today? Because today might be, tomorrow is not promised to you. That's good. But are you living for the return? That's a great question. And that's what I posed after I got out of the hospital. Am I going to live for his return? Come on. All right. The original Greek, um, 1 Peter 1, is a single run-on sentence. Biblical scholar Scott McKnight notes that the 1 Peter, that despite the sentence link, Peter's grammar is wonderfully elegant in his expression of a beautiful and of beauty of our salvation is profound. He goes on to explain each of the elements in Peter's singular declaration, praises built um, from the previous thought. Excuse me, sorry about that. The expression of praise leads into a declaration of joy despite suffering. That joy is but on the anticipation of our final salvation which is what the prophet all spoke and looked forward to. That's what all the prophets spoke and looked forward to, right? Peter's blessing of God at the opening of the letter draws a circle around all life. From the beginning to the end, every point towards our salvation and the ultimate realization of God's kingdom. Right? And go to the next slide, bro. And it's all how we respond to the disruptions. What are you, how are you responding to your disruption? And, and right now, you know, um, we know there's a lot of disruptions with COVID. There's a lot of disruptions with finances and all, you name it, right? There's disruptions. But I wanted to share with you one last scripture. I didn't put it up there, but it's in Lamentations. The Lord is good to those who depend on him, those who search for him. So it is good to wait I looked up that word wait, because there's a great song. We're going to play it at the end, but waiting on the Lord. What does that mean? What does that look like? Right? In the Greek, that word is to long for. It's pain, childbirth. Woo! Childbirth. Well, so when we wait... I don't know if you ever witnessed my wife. We've had, we've had a couple of kiddos. Um, if you witnessed childbirth. But it's, it's pain. I, I've never been through that pain. My wife's been through it. It's painful. Um, my daughter's getting ready to go through it. But come on, right? Um, the anticipation of seeing my granddaughter. For the first time, the anticipation, the things that we're doing. And then I, I thought about that. Am I anticipating the day I walk out with Jesus? How am I? Am I, I got to be doing it like I'm doing it for my granddaughter. Building up stuff, hanging up stuff, helping my, my son-in-law do things. And it's just great P- pictures, hanging pictures, and looking at the belly. So I just want to make sure that we, we get that. 
in this new year that we, we look at that and we try to, to get that, to, to meditate on that. So we're prepared, right? And it's good for people to submit at an early age to the yoke of this discipline. Let them sit alone in their silence beneath the Lord's demands. Let them lie face down in the dust, for there may be hope at last. Let them turn their cheek to those who strike them and accept their insults from their enemies, for no one is abandoned by the Lord forever. No one's abandoned by the Lord forever. You got you to gotta catch that. You might have did something bad. You might be going through a sickness. You might have made some mistakes. But the Lord never abandons you forever. Never. Never will. So just a little recap, right? We need to check our intimacy. We need to check what we're being intimate, who we're being intimate with, right? What we're doing with our intimacies. And, and I heard something on the, on, the, on the radio. I listen to KDRY a lot. But um, I, I like listening to J. Vernon McGee. Anybody likes to listen to J. Vernon McGee? Come on. You know he's been dead for 20 plus years? <laughs> and he still, every day has a, has a word going out. I think that's just so awesome. But if you have a struggle reading the word, reading the Bible, setting time up, pastor. You know, we blame the translations. We blame there's no Bible study in my church. Our pastor, he, he's too loud. He's too soft. He's too, we make a lot of excuses, but we need to check our attitude. He, he said it like this, y'all are spoiled little brats. And I was like, whoa, that guy's tough. And he says it like it is, right? But, you know, we need to check our attitude. If we're having a problem reading the word, we need to check our heart. Right, um, we need to check our anticipation. What are we anticipating? Some some of the translations put expect, but I like the word anticipate better than expect. Expect seems to me like more of a of a proudness. I expect you to do this. I expect this. I expect that. Well, no, I anticipate the day that I meet the Lord. I anticipate the day the Lord rescues me. I anticipate the day. That Mark is up here talking and giving a testimony of his story. Not Mark's story, Jesus' story. Come on. And then, last, are you waiting on the Lord? How do we do that? I'm, I'm in pain. My son's on a ventilator. I don't have no money in the bank. I got a foreclosure notice. I got this. I got that. How do I wait on the Lord? Well, just like a, a, a mother was giving childbirth, she's going to push. You know, and it was funny how they told me when I was in the um, emergency room to breathe, one of our last little ones, I think, um, my wife wasn't breathing, and they were going to put her on oxygen during the child labor. And um, my wife said, I don't want to be on oxygen. And the, the nurse said, well, you need to breathe. We're not going to breathe. We're going to put you on oxygen. She, I think she was holding her breath to, uh, that, my wife's crazy. She, she's old school. And she was holding her breath to, to push the baby out. But um, we got to breathe. And it's funny how breathing, we need to breathe in the air, right? Because in the beginning, right, he blew air, right? Blew it. We got to breathe in that air. Come on. So whatever barriers you're facing when reading the Bible, fight through them. Fight through them. Make, make space and time to listen to God's voice. Sometimes it's just meditating. Don't read a whole. You don't have to read a, a whole. I'm going to read all of Romans, right? Starting today, I'm going to go on a, on a, what do they do when they avenge, right? They're going to avenge watch. A little Netflix. I'm going to avenge um, Romans, it's not going to work. Take a little portion of it. Meditate on it. You might need to read Romans 8.28 all week long. That's what I did. I read it all week long after Pastor. And it, it, every day did something different for me. Every day I learned something different. 
from one sentence. Romans 8, 28. Come on. And, and sometimes you need to do that. If you don't get it, read it. Meditate on it. Look, Google. We Google everything. But we don't want to Google the word. Come on. And, and in our non-negotiable, you got to say this, right? Lord, help me to experience the scriptures as a living document. Help me to experience your word as a living document to apply to my life today. You know, in, in, in closing, as I spoke to our, our, our athletes, our student athletes, um, I didn't think they were getting it. We're still having fights. We're still having, you know, it was going crazy inside the building. And um, I prayed. I prayed, God, what, well, what can I do? What can I do to help him? And he says, you're telling them about me, but you're not introducing me. And pastor said, we need to introduce. If you introduce God to your problem, whoo, things will change. So we went down the Roman road. This season, we went down the Roman road. Our last five games, I hit elites, each portion of the Roman road with my students or my athletes. In the last game, we played Burbank. We beat Burbank. Right? And there was a lot of bad calls. The last part of the game, um, when we kneel, right, you, the last few seconds, the game's already won. You can kneel and run out the clock. Burbank did some cheap shots, cheap shots, hit our guys in the head. And my wife noticed it. She said, man, they didn't fight. See, when, when, when you attack some of our guys on the east side, you hit them on the head, you better watch out. You might get three or four hits from all over, you know. And they just stood there. And I'm like, wow, you work, Jesus. You work. If I introduce you to some problems, not me, you, he, Jesus, a lot of times we need to proclaim his name, right? Because if we say God, we don't know what God they're talking about, really, in, in certain, right? We need to say the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Right? So people understand the God we're talking about. So I wanted to close with that is make sure you introduce God to your problems. And it'll, it'll revolutionize the way you think.